was uh, a document put together uh, generally in 2014 time frame. Um, that was an effort on the part of the Department of Local Affairs uh, and a number of other uh, partnership agencies to really take a look broadly at resiliency in Colorado and come up with a framework for uh, uh, for the future. Um, is of, of interest to some on the call may be that uh, Tom led uh, a, a team of essentially uh, uh, CPCB assets to support the state and development of that. And I think that was a successful uh, application of the CPCB doctrine. Um, and that framework doc document is actually online as well. So if anybody's interested in taking a look at that, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, the Planning for Hazards uh, tool and guide is, uh, you know, I think hits Tom and I right where we live in the old zoning solar plexus. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it, it is what it says it is. It's a, it's a guide for local land use decision making. And uh, I'm just I'm happy to have been, uh, you know, involved in that process. I'm really proud of my state for the leadership that they've shown in putting this together. And, um, you know, I'll turn it over to, to Anderley and uh, Andrew and Waverly, I'm, I'm already conflating the two of you together somehow, <laughs> um, to, to go ahead and, uh, and kick us off and tell us a little bit about the tool. Sure. So, uh, well, thank you. So I'm Andy Rimbach. I'm a professor in urban and regional planning at the University of Colorado in Denver. And so, um, as, as Tim mentioned, you know, in 2012 and 2013, the state of Colorado had a number of, of federally declared disasters, both from, from wildfire and then really a, a devastating uh, flood event that was the most expensive economically disaster in state history, and um, a lot of the, the work that's been being done here in Colorado around resilience planning at the local level came out of those of those disasters. And so, uh, the Planning for Hazards Guide um, it was initiated to really to think about how could we um, think about long-term recovery to build back better, um, to use a, a phrase that we're all familiar with, uh, and really to help communities to think about how. Um, they could really proactively plan uh, for future risks through land use planning strategies. Um, so the the idea was really was really, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, a state effort, a state idea that came out of the Department of Local Affairs. Um, they approached the University of Colorado as a partner uh, to help in the development, and then we put out a national request for proposals, and a number of, of really um, uh, great firms applied, and Clarion Associates ultimately. Uh, won the proposal and led the development of the guide. Um, Clarion, uh, they put together a great team that included not just themselves but other consultants from, for example, Molly Mowry from Wildfire Planning International, a group that really represented a lot of expertise both in hazard science but also in uh, land use planning uh, for hazard mitigation and long-term recovery. Uh, the project is being funded with a CDBG DR grant. Um, and after, uh, I believe, about 12 to 18 months of development, um, the, the, the website and guide were published in March of 2016. I'll say that a really integral part of the guide development process was an advisory committee that included uh, local, state, federal partners, as well as nonprofit uh, uh, folks. And so that included uh, Tim and Tom, for example, but also uh, local leadership from, from state and county government, um, as well as folks, for example, Kathleen Tierney from the University of Colorado Natural Hazard Center. And so today we're just going to really briefly, we're going to um, do an overview of the, the, the sort of what the, the thinking is that informed the development of the guide, the, the guide itself, uh, talk a little bit about the website, which is really the uh, the continued evolution of the guide is happening online through a, a fairly dynamic website, and then we'll talk about some of the things we're doing moving forward to take the next steps from, from uh, you know, knowledge to implementation is how we're thinking about it. And so just real quickly, some of the, the general principles that went into the Planning for Hazards Guide, and this will really uh, be nothing new for, for the folks on this call, but I just wanted to review them really quickly. So obviously we think a lot about hazard avoidance as one of the most effective ways to not only to reduce risk, but also to reduce the damages and cost of disasters, but also as, as planners and public officials, we're painfully aware that, that avoidance isn't always uh, or possible, whether because of historic development trends or because of political situations on the ground. And so um, then we think about how can we then try to, you know, have resilient development in the context of hazards, and oftentimes that's preventing new development in hazardous areas, trying to direct future growth to safer areas, or the types of development that are happening in hazardous areas, how can we strengthen the regulations uh, to, to make those development, developments more resilient to hazards in the future. 
And we also, we were really aware of, you know, thinking about community context. For those of you who aren't as familiar with Colorado or, or the Mountain West, um, we have a, a very large urban mega region all the way from Fort Collins in the north all the way down to Pueblo in the south. And then a, a large part of our state is more rural, small town communities. And so when we think about planning for hazards, there's been a lot of focus here on the Front Range because that's where the, the floods and fires have happened. But really, we're trying to think about the whole state. And that necessarily means not just planning for the Denvers and the Boulders, but also for the Grand Junctions and the Pagosa Springs of the state. And so we really try to take into account all the way through the guide development process different types of communities their size, their geographic location, their capacities, uh, and especially the, the community goals and political will that you might see on the ground there. We also try to think about, of course, the interrelatedness of hazards. Um, you know, here in Colorado, for example, uh, we see a lot of post-fire flooding that's really affected communities like Manitou Springs. And so trying to think about the interrelatedness of hazards and not have um, tools and tips that are just single hazard specific, they're really to, to think about the, the larger sort of interconnectedness of the hazard landscape. And then as, as I mentioned before, with the advisory committee and with the, the development of the guide and now the implementation, we're thinking about a collaborative approach, approach to planning for hazards. Uh, land use planners have a certain set of tools, but um, it's, it's absolutely necessary they're able to work with and communicate with um, emergency managers, public officials, community advocates, businesses, developers, citizens. And so uh, the, the ethos behind the guide and the tools that we're going to present oftentimes have a focus on how do you bring different actors together around the table and try to reach consensus on uh, land use tools that might, might help improve resilience in their communities. So I'm going to pass it over to Waverly now who's going to describe the, the guide itself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having us today. Uh, my name is Waverly Claw. I am a hazards and land use planner um, with the Department of Local Affairs in Colorado. And uh, I've been uh, working uh, with DOLA over the past few years to develop this guide, and I'm really pleased to be able to share it with you today. So just to give a... Um, a sense of the overall goals of the guide. Like Andy said, we really wanted to communicate to multiple audiences within the state of Colorado, very small, you know, mountainous communities, uh, larger communities in the plains, metropolitan communities, etc. And we wanted to ensure that all the content is accessible in uh, various formats. And that was the reasoning behind developing a printed guide, which really takes the reader through from start to finish, section by section, uh, and also have a website that Andy's going to talk a little bit more later that allows uh, users to access the information in different ways and in different orders. So the outline of the Planning for Hazards Guide includes the introduction and summary first. Um, it includes the planning framework as well as some of the planning principles that Andy outlined. Um, and it then takes uh, the reader through the process of how to conduct a hazard identification and risk assessment. And that section um, uh, cites FEMA processes quite heavily. You know, we feel that that's the most appropriate way to guide folks through um, particular smaller, particularly smaller communities who may not be doing a county level. Uh, hazard mitigation plan regularly and are perhaps a little bit less familiar with the HIRA process. We then move to really the bulk of the guide, which is a set of planning tools and strategies that um, serve as a kind of a menu for communities to select which, uh, you know, based on what their highest risk hazards are, what tools may be most successful to mitigate their risk to those hazards. Um, we then have a moving forward section that outlines strategies for embarking upon this process in your own community. Um, and finally, we have actually a fairly hefty, hefty appendix. It outlines all of the major hazards in Colorado, um, and I'll go into that in just a moment. So the hazards line up in this guide include 11 different hazards. Um, they are uh, largely natural hazards, although you'll see we have included hazardous material release uh, because it has a strong connection with land use planning. Um, these are fairly Colorado specific hazards. We don't um, discuss uh, tsunamis or coastal flooding and, and rather 
really dig into things like landslides, uh, flooding, um, and wildfire, which are uh, really prevalent here in Colorado. Uh, so this is a list of our planning tool profiles that we um, describe in about four to six pages each in our guide, and they are broken down into six different sections based on the type of tool that they are. And these uh, include addressing hazards in plans and policies. Uh, so you'll see, you know, strategies on developing climate plans or parks and open space plans, um, strengthening incentive programs, such as participating in the community rating system, uh, considering development agreements, protecting sensitive areas is our third category, and it goes through options for um, land acquisition programs, overlay zoning, uh, things of that nature. We have uh, a section on site development standards, what can be done there to reduce hazard risks during that um, period of review, um, improving buildings and infrastructure, and then uh, certain administrative procedures that could be um, employed in a certain way to uh, reduce hazard risks. And I'll show you visually what these tool profiles look like in a moment, um, but we, in each tool profile, go through certain bits of information, including how the tool itself works, how it would be implemented. Um, we include fairly Colorado-specific case studies um, as much as, as we could that describe where it's been done. Uh, and then we discuss some of the advantages of this particular tool as well as the challenges that a community might encounter in uh, implementing the tool. And in some cases, when it's applicable, we were able to include a section of model code language that communities can use to tailor um, to their own needs, but that would give them kind of a starting point for developing code language. Um, and then we also include key facts and some examples. So this is what the tool profiles look like. Um, as you can see, this is on subdivision and site design standards, and it basically goes through the process um, that I just outlined. So for example, some of the, um, the case studies that we include in these sections are kind of intended to give the reader a more detailed understanding of um, what other communities have done with this particular tool. So with subdivision and site design standards, we highlighted Pagosa Springs, Colorado, which has integrated um, some sensitive area protection standards into their code um, that specifically address um, uh, subdivision applications um, or redevelopment applications that may be influenced by steep slopes, natural features, um, special flood hazard areas, geologic hazards, et cetera. So for example, if you're looking at um, potentially subdividing in a geologic hazard area, um, in the standards it st stipulates that you can't um, have a development that would potentially create undue financial burden on future residents, you know, what if you build something and then there, um, there is a landslide, you know, that creates an undue financial burden, um, you know, how are you designing your structures to pre prevent risk to life and property, um, and how are you demonstrating that you're avoiding or mitigating hazards at initial construction. Um, so out of our uh, 25 uh, uh, planning tools, we have um, several of them that include model code language, and you can see those highlighted in that sort of salmon color right there. And what that looks like is um, language that is the model code language is included in blue for local governments that can be tailored, um, and it on the right, you'll see that there's commentary on that model code language that can um, provide further guidance and information about 
um, why that language was chosen or how it could be modified. So for example, if you're looking at cluster subdivisions, it takes you through the various sections. This is about applicability, um, you know, how you would apply cluster uh, subdivisions, who it applies to, and you'll see in the commentary section, it suggests that you don't necessarily have to make this mandatory, it can also be an optional program. And in creating the model code language, there's always um, a bit of a challenge in uh, ensuring that what you are putting out there fits various communities. And so we did try to select language from communities that uh, provide a broad range um, of examples. And so we had sort of a county in the southwest, a big city, a small town, um, a resort county. And that is one way that we tried to ensure that the model language would be fairly broadly applicable to all. And then the appendix talks about the hazards in Colorado. Um, each hazard has a description, what the risk level is in Colorado, um, how that hazard may be interrelated with other hazards. Um, it tries to point communities as much as possible to available data sources um, and allows you to see right there which planning tools and strategies are applicable to that hazard. So you can then understand, oh, cluster subdivisions would work well in mitigating risk to this hazard. Let me flip to that page in the guide. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Andy to talk about the, the website. So as we mentioned earlier, the, the guide itself is a printed guide that, that follows, you know, sort of chapter by chapter outline, but we also uh, really, we realize that, that today you really want to have a dynamic web presence with this kind of material as well. There's certainly folks who are going to want to download the guide and read it uh, in, in physical form, but uh, a website allows us to present the information in a way that can, can meet different users' needs a little bit more dynamically. So if you're in front of a computer, you know, feel free to, to go to planningforhazards.com and you can see the um, as part of the, the RFP from Clarion, they hired this, this, a great local Denver uh, web developer called the Urban Interactive Studio who really specializes in planning and community development websites. And so they did a, a great job of creating a, a website that's not only visually appealing, but uh, again, we spent a lot of time thinking about the architecture of the site and what are the different kinds of users that might uh, click onto a site like Planning for Hazards and how can we get them uh, engaged as quickly as possible. And so the goals of the website really were to, as I said, accommodate different user experiences, to have a good user-friendly inter interface, uh, easy to access information from the printed guide. If you saw something in the printed guide and you wanted to go online and see additional information, it would be easy to get there. Um, enriched media and then dynamic with new content over time. Uh, and in our design process, we really thought about sort of three sort of um, archetypes of users. We have a, a student who is really just sort of starting out, doesn't know a whole lot about planning for hazards, uh, but wants to learn. And so they might walk through the site in its entirety, starting from the beginning and, and ending up at the, the most advanced material, which is the, the local land use code uh, types of, of stuff. Um, Jim is a, a planner who has a lot of experience with this stuff, and he's really maybe looking for a specific bit of information. You know, how do community wildfire protection plans work? What are examples he can look at? What are some, some model you know, codes or ordinances that they might use in his community? Uh, and then we have Gina, who's an elected official, who might be thinking more about implementation. How, you know, what are the potential ramifications of doing this type of land use uh, tool? What are some of the different kinds of resource needs or constraints that I might see? What are some of the strategies for making it successful in my community? And then maybe most important, what other communities have done this stuff and who can I reach out to and, and learn about their experiences? Um, and so, as I said, you know, Jim is our example of a of an experienced person who wants to really ask some very specific questions and wants to get right to the doesn't need to read about the hiring process. It's familiar with that, but may may want to brush up on some specific knowledge and tools. And so on the website, uh, it's organized in a number of different ways. Uh, for example, you can go directly to different hazards and look at the way you know it'll uh, it'll sort the different land use tools and their applicability to different hazards. So in this case, you have a wildfire, uh, and when you click on that, it'll bring up not only the information about the hazard itself uh, and and different sources of information, but then also you can see along the right hand column, it automatically links to the applicable planning tools and strategy that a community might think about if they're wanting to strengthen their resilience to, to wildfire hazards. 
Um, and then at the, at the, again at the bottom there you can see where you can click directly into the different different tools. Um, and so that would take you, if you clicked on that, that would take you right to the overlay zoning tool, uh, which Waverly showed before. So we have a, a graphical sort of representation that looks similar to um, in the guide itself, but is much more dynamic. There's uh, hot links throughout that link you to the various uh, external resources. Along the right-hand side, there's a lot of key facts and quick facts, whether it's the administrative capacity you might need, uh, direct links to different communities' plans that you might find instructive, um, sources of data, et cetera. We also, as part of the development process, we, you know, we, we really feel like the voices of local planners who've actually been in the trenches and done some of these things uh, are really important. So we've been developing a series of practitioner interviews with different planners from around the state. Um, I think we just published our 10th video. Um, as I've always said, we're not, um, you know, we're not Steven Spielberg's over here, but the videos themselves are really instructive and they're organized around different tools. In some cases, they might be organized around a specific sort of um, domain of planning. For example, we just published a, a new video about protecting historic resources in Manitou Springs, which is a, a huge challenge when you have an old downtown right in the hazard area and that you need it for economic development, but you also want to protect residents from harm. And so uh, there's a lot of great video interviews there. We also have a library of resources that link to external videos for various, either describing different hazard types or, for example, uh, videos about the CRS program. Okay, so um, just to give you a, a bit of an overview of, of where we are now and what we plan to do moving forward, um, you know, we're really focused now on putting the guide into action. You know, it is our desire um, as an open source, public, publicly available, free resource, we'd like it to be utilized as much as possible. Um, we are partnering with the Center for Sustainable Urbanism at the University of Colorado um, with Andrew, um, with Andy, in order to both maintain and update the website. We want to keep this content fresh and dynamic um, and uh, ensure that it doesn't just slide into oblivion. Um, and we are also developing some additional resources that can help a community interested in carrying out a process like this um, help them with some pre-developed uh, strategies and materials. And so we're developing a facilitator um, workbook uh, and accompanying participant workbook that um, really takes someone through um, approximately six work sessions where a small working group of seven to ten individuals would go through assessing risks and um, looking at options for uh, land use planning tools and strategies, selecting them, and then actually implementing that. Um, and uh, in order to see how this works in the real world, we are um, piloting the process with two communities in Colorado. Um, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, a little bit more about the materials that are going to be available to communities to accompany the guide. Um, we've developed sort of a, a strategy of six work sessions that would be deployed um, several months apart from one another that would take the community through the various steps. Um, each work session uh, in the facilitator's handbook has a description of what a draft agenda would look like, um, supporting materials for the facilitator for what they need to prepare for, um, what perhaps sources of data they need to look up in advance, and um, basically tries to support them as much as possible in, in kind of a generic way in um, leading this effort. We also have these draft uh, handouts and materials such as draft agendas, draft worksheets, et cetera, that could all be modified in uh, a Word document. Uh, and this is an example of maybe a handout that would um, help this working group through the process of identifying their community assets, for example. Um, we'll be piloting this in Manitou Springs, Colorado, and actually are beginning that uh, in two weeks. Uh, and then we'll also be working with the town of Milligan, Colorado. And these are kind of 
quite different communities, and we're really looking forward to um, to seeing how our materials work with the community, and then making final changes before um, uh, before finishing this facilitator's guide and um, and participant guide. And uh, I'd say an additional benefit of these communities beyond just piloting our process is that we'll be furnishing the resources to actually develop the land use strategies that they select um, and allow them to a process of editing and becoming satisfied with whatever tools they're going to end up using. And I guess at this point, um, that wraps up our portion of the presentation. Um, considering that we have a group of folks in the room who are um, working one-on-one -on -one with communities and um, have a lot of expertise in this area, we'd love to open it up and get people's thoughts about this tool, um, both the guide, the website, and the upcoming facilitator um, handbook materials. Um, and we'd love to hear, you know, is this something that you think might be useful? Uh, we did tailor the guide um, to a Colorado audience, but um, many of the tools and many of the, the resources in the guide are easily applicable across the country. And so... Um, well, that was going to be my first question. <laughs> you know, is it so Colorado specific or really are, I mean, is a transferable de development right saying in Colorado as it might be in Nevada or Alabama or someplace else? I mean, in other words, how much tweaking might, might another state or another region have to do to make this uh, sort of calibrate it for their use, do you think? I mean, that's, you know, I was going to say that one of the one of our goals all along, and we're really hoping, and we do hope others say this, is like, this is a, you know, a, a great effort between a lot of different partners. Um, the material we see is sort of open source. We really hope other states will actually pick up this guide and use it in whatever way works best, including creating their own state-specific guide where they take all the material they can from, from our guide and use it in their own. And then, you know, I think the areas where probably it's most Colorado-specific are all the, most of the examples are Colorado because we really wanted to have sure. communities. Okay. Yeah. But, but, you know, oftentimes best practices only exist in a few places. Um, I think then also some of the legal frameworks would need to be evaluated because Colorado law is a little you know, unique uh, in some ways. And, but overall, I, you know, I always think you're probably 75% of the work has been done, and it's a great resource. And we just celebrated, I think, the one-year anniversary, and we've had over 20,000 hits on the website, and they're not all coming from Colorado. There's a lot of, um, a lot of folks coming from all over the country as well as uh, internationally. And so I think there is an appetite for this kind of information. And, again, we would love to see another state pick up the guide and, and, and create their own version and, and, and see where that takes them. Um, not to commandeer the conversation, but I do have another question. And so you mentioned that uh, this pilot implementation project is happening in two communities. And, it, and, and when you talked a little bit about what that looked like, I mean, there's a, there's a part where you identify a community's hazards, and there's presumably some sort of uh, analysis there. And then, and then part of the tool selection through the guide is really akin, I think, to a hazard mitigation planning process where you're developing a strategy. So right. my question is, do either of those communities or do you see other communities potentially integrating implementation of the guide into a hazard mitigation planning process or integrate, integrating the two together so that there's... Right. I think that would be fantastic because, you know, we're just taking one sliver of right. the greater hazard mitigation sort of project. And... Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, land use, you know, how does future development either increase or decrease a community's risk to hazards? And I think um, it does seem to me that if a hazard mitigation planning process is underway and, um, you know, project worksheets are being developed for, you know, what are maybe some of the more infrastructure heavy projects that a community would like to complete to mitigate their hazards. You know, at the same time, would this process assist in developing some project worksheets on land use tools and strategies as well? 
Well, it may be worth another conversation sort of offline but with, with us in the region and with mitigation to see if that implementation activity is somehow fundable through mitigations grants that they put out to communities to help them put their hazard mitigation plans together because that could see tying the two activities together at the point in time when they're updating their hazard mitigation plan and really kind of baking this stuff into that process. And the other thing it would do is it bring the community planner to the table and I think we we suspect, we suspect that that's not often the case, that the hazard mitigation plan updates get done by the, the emergency manager. Right probably most of the time without involvement of land use planning. And that's, I, you know, that's, that's of course, a relationship I think we would try to encourage. So yeah. I'd love to have that conversation and see if we could connect to hazard mitigation more, more substantively. I think that would be great. And the way that, you know, the, the materials are structured now in the facilitator's handbook and in the guide is, you know, for communities to begin by reviewing their hazard mitigation plan, and it depends on where they are in the process, but there are some assumptions that they'll look back at whatever the last hazard mitigation plan was and use that as a basis and as a starting point. But um, I think also considering merging some of these processes into the hazard mitigation process itself when it comes up right. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is this is Andrew, um, and I think that's a great point about integration with hazard mitigation plans. But how does maybe you, maybe uh, Waverly and you can talk about this a little bit? But how does this integrate into other pre-existing planning initiatives in the state? Um, we're you know rolling out our uh, pre-disaster recovery planning guides. Um, the planning process is somewhat similar. It's just a, just, just different um, different constituents. But how do we sort of weave them together to create a coherent uh, process or a create coherent plan? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the way that we address it in the guide for local communities is um, just as they're kind of instructed to start with the hazard mitigation plan that's current. Um, they're also asked to look at all of their overarching planning documents and frameworks and use that as a starting point and look through the comprehensive plan and pull out whatever um, language exists or recognize that it doesn't exist in their um, comprehensive plan and, and kind of begin from what already exists and then move forward um, on that. That's the way that we're currently uh, addressing that. I would say, just, you know, this is Tim, um, from my perspective, working in the region, trying to, you know, we, we work with the states and typically with the emergency management group in the states to develop pre-disaster recovery plans at the state level. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not resourced right now to really reach down to the local level to encourage that at that to be there in all those communities. I mean, um, so I think that's a challenge, Andrew. It's just a practical challenge of getting the information in the hands of the locals and getting them to what we really just said, you know, actually understanding how important those other documents are and, and how important it is to integrate review of those documents in their process. You'd, you'd hope they would do it kind of naturally because they would say in their heads, oh, this is about hazards and we have a hazard mitigation plan and oh we didn't we do a pre-disaster mitigation plan you know they bring them all together but I I think we've got a, I think we've got some work to do there to to raise awareness and and, and then potentially seek engagement with that process um, this is this is Andy I'll also say you know one thing we didn't mention is is part of the ongoing work that we're doing between the University of Colorado and and Dola is, is adding additional tools to the site we have a resilience planning tool coming out soon. We have a capital improvement plan tool following after that. We're planning to update the recovery planning tool working with, with, our, uh, with FEMA here. Um, but we've talked about, you know, one of the emerging best practices is, is plan integration and how you can actually evaluate plan integration. And there's some really great work going on uh, down at, at Texas A&M being funded by the, the Coastal Hazard Center out of North Carolina. But um, I think that that might be one of our future tool development is really um, some some they call it the resilience scorecard, but it's a it's a fairly um, it's it's 
takes the mind-numbing task of doing plan evaluation and makes it as painless as possible. And I, I think like that that is that. absolutely an emerging best practice is a lot of different plans not really talking to each other and sometimes actually across purposes with each other. So I think, um, yeah, I think you hit right on the, the nail on the head in terms of an area where we know we can do better. I will say that in the Colorado, several of the front range communities we're working with, including Millican and Manitou Springs, are now doing integrated comp plan and hazard mitigation plan updates. And I really think that they're part of an emerging best practice in the country of, of bringing those planning processes together rather than doing them in separate silos. Right. And just one last point on this is that, you know, when we had our initial meetings with these um, communities that were going to pilot our implementation process for the guide, um, the question came up about, well, what's going to be the product of these six work sessions? Are we going to have, are we working towards a plan? And I think what we needed to emphasize is that this process is not going to result in another plan. It's actually kind of an evaluation of existing plans, a determination of, you know, what land use tools and strategies will be effective in the community, and then actually just development and implementation of those strategies. And so I think in some cases communities are, you know, so used to, you know, the planning process, we're going to create a plan for this, a plan for that, and we're trying to stay away from that in this process where you're actually ending up with products, not plans, not right. plans. Yeah, it looks like someone might be typing something in. Well, this is Tom Rounds. Um, Andy and Waverly both mentioned that uh, this is open source and available for uh, appropriation in other states. Um, can you describe a process who they should contact if if uh, one of the regional coordinators wanted to work something out with with the states they're working in to to make that happen? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, our emails are at the end here. Um, either one of us really, I mean, the, the DOLA and CU Denver team, we are on the phone with each other at least once a month and often communicating much more often than that. So I think uh, we should, um, we'd be happy to answer your questions, um, either one of us, and, and we'll put it to the team. I should say we also have several other folks who are very involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Gretel Follenstad from CU Denver, who's a PhD student uh, in, in urban and regional planning. Rocky Pira, who's the director of the Center for Sustainable Urbanism, Ann Miller and Logan Sand here at, at, at DOLA. So there's a whole team that are, that are working on this. And again, we work very closely here in the region with FEMA and with other state partners. So we'd be happy to share our experiences, hand you the raw materials if you would like to, to explore it further, or talk more about, you know, I think we've done a, a fairly good job being sort of lean and mean with our resources and leveraging some of our, our resources like the university uh, to help to accomplish some of these goals. Great. I, I wanted to ask you kind of an associating question that you've mentioned the Center for Urbanism a couple of times at the University of Colorado, uh, and that's at the College of Architecture and Planning, right, at the Denver campus. Um, I'm aware that they just uh, Adopted or, or uh, I guess adopted might be a bit the best word. The uh, Sustainable uh, Community Development Code. Mm -hmm. Has there been any thought given again talking about integrating plans and codes? Has there been any thought given to the interface or I don't know the the overlap between what this is and what that is? And I know most m many on the call may not know what the uh, Sustainable Urban Sustainable Community Development Code is, but if you Google it, you'll find it pretty quickly. I mean, is there an, an interface, an overlap, and uh, how might that play out over the course of the, this development here? Yeah, there absolutely is. The CCSU is the leading the adoption, if you want to call it, from the Denver University. And um, we've had a number of conversations already, not reinventing the wheel. And sure. a lot of those, that code is relative to hazards. And so I think the plan in the future is to, where we can, use the materials from each other's guides and link cross-link the guides so that for example, if a community wants to update their development code holistically with the Sustainable Development Code Framework, they would also then be uh, thinking about hazards naturally as part of that process. So, absolutely. Great. Uh, this is Matt Campbell. Um, question, or yeah, I guess a couple of questions. Um, so we talked about how it, it could expand, if you will, or interface with the mitigation plan. You mentioned 
the recovery planning tools or guide, uh, that was going to be a question of mine. You know, do the tools talk about the post-disaster period, and maybe we could look at how you're you're integrating that, because the even though we you know we put out a, a guide for developing a, a pre-disaster recovery plan, but you know one of the points made in there is it doesn't have to be something standalone, you know, and 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 you know integrated in a key place like this uh, is probably more important than it being integrated. Uh, by itself in an emergency operations plan, as we know, you know. And so the a question was, how much do you address the post-disaster period? Do you kind of uh, reference or utilize any of the material from the, the APA, uh, the Green Book, the Planning for Post-Disaster Recovery? Um, and then I, I went looking for a copy of the Joint FEMA APA document, the integrating mitigation, or integra yeah, integrating mitigation into planning, to see what they talk about in terms of tools. But you know, maybe there's some uh, further discussion on on all those points. I threw a lot out there, so. Yeah, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I just scrolled back to the list of planning tool profiles, and currently in our guide. Um, we discuss uh, pre-disaster planning, um, COOPS, COGS, and post-disaster recovery plans um, as one tool, which, you know, we're looking to update because new resources have, have come online even since we published this in March, um, as well as we address um, post-disaster building moratoriums in our guide as a tool as well. But you know, this is not an exhaustive list, and I think that there is an opportunity to um, look at perhaps additional, op you know, areas of guidance where we can say, I mean, the audience here is primarily a community that's looking ahead and looking forward at um, reducing their risks. And um, we're, like Andy said, we're developing new tools right now and open to new um, new tool topics or modification of existing ones, updating them. Yeah. And I'll, I'll also say, I, well, you know, one, one thing we should mention is that we, we continue to have a steering committee that I believe it's about 12 different folks, again, state, local, federal government. Tim is, is a member of that, and he's just in our last meeting was talking about improving the, the post-disaster recovery resources on the site it would be a good area of focus. Folks kind of expanding right. it to include both views of that and provide some resources, you know, there's, yeah, yeah. so if we, yeah, and yeah, that's still an intention on, I think, on my part to get some yeah. information back to you all. And I think we're looking forward to, uh, we really take the steering committee's guidance as sort of our marching orders in a lot of ways. I'll also say that the, the, the work between the APA and FEMA and Jim Schwab's group, that's really been very influential on the site. I think you'll see it throughout. We really tried to, to at the time of the guide's development, we tried to incorporate the best possible information. The green book was the updated green book was not quite out yet, and so that, along with FEMA's new uh, recovery planning guide, I think will will be the the basis for probably a, a pretty dramatic update of our post disaster recovery tool. Which is a strange thing to call that a tool because it's such an enormous, huge, overarching process. But certainly for a community that's experienced a disaster and is looking for some guidance on how to set up a planning process that we, we hope to, to be a better service to them. Yeah, some, some uh, Matt, again, uh, some other things to, to think about, and I don't know how they're, well, Dole might know about this, but the HUD put out a, a, a rule mid, late last year for integrating a resilience component into the consolidated plan, um, and then a, uh, not strictly at the municipal level, but at the regional Planning Commission or Economic Development District level, EDA has a requirement for recovery and resilience component of the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. And of course, in rural areas, that's going to play an even more a bigger role. So those might be things to, to look at in terms of connections. Um, Great, thank you. That's. I, I think you know when we when we've really been looking at our set of tools too. Another area that we've identified as a potential place for future development is a more regional look at planning. Uh, my, most of our tools at this point are local government, um, and we, we realize that the regional plans have a huge yeah. influence, yeah. Um, and so what we yeah. think that that's a great suggestion. Well, and, and I, I don't know if, if that's the case in Colorado, but, you know, to 
depending on the RPC, they might be out actually helping a municipality do some of these things. So if they've already get, if they're already being more so, hopefully pre-programmed for resilience and recovery conversations, and that would be good. But I, you know, I think EDA's probably been working with them on some tools. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, um, since you all have a great learning laboratory, uh, collabor collaboration laboratory, I don't know what we call it, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's been. I think it's. But, but some really productive partnerships came out of the the pretty horrific floods we had, and so really, it's interesting. We're sitting around the table, and we've been sitting around the table together, the same folks now for, for multiple years from very different institutions, and it's it's been, um, it's been a great collaboration to be part of. And there are more who aren't at the table. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's. So just sitting here thinking about the folks I talk to on a monthly basis who are federal partners in all of our different states who would probably find this of interest. You know, oftentimes we sit down and we talk about what's going on and it becomes a brief out, but I would love to key you guys up to talk about this tool and the guide to, you know, our partnership counterparts in HUD and EPA and EDA and USDA so that they have some glimmer that there's there's something like this out there. Because their constituents are the people in the communities who are making things happen, whether they're planners or elected officials or program managers. Yeah. I, I think there's some there would be some value in sharing this well, at that level. And you know, I just want to emphasize I think as as I think we see it and we've talked a little bit about it today, I think the things that really distinguish the guide here is one is the specificity to the state. I think that was something we saw in a lot of these sort of big picture national guides is they tend to return to the same states. There's a lot of Florida examples. There's a lot of Louisiana examples. There's a lot of examples in coastal states. And there wasn't nearly as much in the Mountain West. And I think in any state where you can look at a community like yours and you can pick up the phone and call someone you see at the APA conference, that helps. Um, I also think, you know, if you want to emphasize how this is different, I think the model code language and the sort of specific tools really, you know, has been one of the most sort of positively received aspects of this because to be, you know, let's be completely honest. I don't think the huge capacity communities are using this guide. It's oftentimes the small town that has a couple of planners, if even that, and they're looking for ways to really be efficient with doing these. They, you know, they want to be more resilient, but you know, they, they don't have millions of dollars to spend the resources. Yeah. And so this, you know, the, the model code development, you know, that that alone is, is is a very valuable thing for them to see how they could actually plug it directly. So I, I think in those two areas, that's a great way to emphasize how this guide looks a little bit different. I think we're all sort of probably in a little bit of guide overload recently. There's so many great materials out there, but at a certain point, a lot of communities are asking, okay, I'm almost overwhelmed now, and so how do we actually get this implemented? And so, um, you know, I think the work that Waverly and the Implementation Project's doing is great, but we're always looking for any suggestions anyone might have about making these types of materials more directly relevant and usable immediately by communities. Uh, I think it's an ongoing challenge. Great. I will. To, this is Tom. I want to say that that uh, you know one of the things I saw in an earlier presentation on this was the the ability for someone who is just dipping their toe in the water to find you know relevant material like the student that is uh, identified up there as the as the user. But you know if if you're looking at how to how does one tool assist us with multiple. Uh, uh, hazard situations, you know, that cross-reference is also part of this. So, you know, it, it really has an awful lot of thought on how to how to meet the diverse needs of a, of a broad uh, uh, ranging uh, population or, or community descriptions. It, it, it's developed for Colorado, but there are parts in here that, that would be uh, appropriate for a boulder as well as for a uh, uh, an eerie, uh, you know, large town, small city, uh, you know, areas. And, and we're very happy to, to facilitate whatever is helpful, whether it's providing slides to use to present the guide, whether it's having one of us from the group here at DOLA, U Denver, FEMA come help present the guide. You know, we have a, a whole, the steering committee goes out and presents the guide in a number of different places. So any way we can be helpful if it's, if it's, this, this material is useful. Can you give you another comment? Yes, please. Hi, this is Tom, Tom Donnelly out in uh, Seattle. Uh, so first of all, congratulations on this document. I think it, it's exceptional. It uh, really hits the mark for a message 
and provides a very user-friendly and uh, understandable tool that I think is going to go very far. Um, I've already tried to give it legs. I've got a presentation tomorrow uh, to a group of local planners and um, literacy managers down in southwestern Washington. That'll be the first of a series of kind of a roadshow that I'm giving to planners and different groups. And while we're sitting here, I've incorporated your information into my slide deck. So I'm going to be sending awesome. that out and uh, giving them as much information as I can. And I'll be also working with our local mitigation group here. So I think it's very appropriate and very applicable to um, all, many of our states that I'm involved with, you know, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, uh, maybe not so much Alaska, but uh, certainly the others uh, very applicable to the hazards that they face and providing the solutions and the guidance for how they can address that. So uh, job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to hear. All right, well, this is, this is Andrew. There's, uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We have three minutes left. Are there any other questions from any of the uh, participants? I don't have anything. All right. All right, well, um, turn it back over to uh, Colorado for any final uh, remarks or uh, comments. Thanks, Andrew. I think we're good here. I just want to thank uh, Andrew and Waverly for their time today and really appreciate the uh, commitment and the support in getting the word out about this. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to, to help with that effort. Yeah, and, and thanks to thanks to Tim for the making the connection and then also for, for hosting us. We're uh, very appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right.